Folks, it's good to see you. Um, the lights are really bright, and if you wear glasses, if there's a slight smudge, it's a re- it's a re- so I'm assuming you're there. Uh, I hope everybody's well. We are working through a series, Exiles and Ambassadors. If you've been here before, I'm not going to go into the spiel that we usually go through because you've, you'll have heard it lots before. But I'm going to ask this question. The question is, how do, we, well, how do we love a city? And what inspires us to love a city? Because I think there's something in this encounter of Paul in Athens that helps us think through what does it look like to get such a passion for people in a particular city. We love the city of Sheffield. We've been set here in the city of Sheffield, whether you came here because you're a student, maybe you were born here, uh, maybe you moved here for work, and maybe you're thinking, I'm not quite sure why I am here. Maybe you wanted to be somewhere else, but you find yourself here. And what we know from Jeremiah chapter 29 is when the people of God ended up in Babylon, the place that they did not want to be, hundreds of miles from Jerusalem, God says, stay there. Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city. Love the city. Wish it well, even the people that you don't like. And so there's a question for us. How do we love the city? Because the, the Christian gospel spreads most rapidly through cities. It did in the early church. It did from the time that we're reading in Acts and through for the first couple of hundred years of the life of the church. It went wild through urban areas. So what is it that we can learn from the Apostle Paul from this passage? So let's, let's kind of jump in. So he's been in Berea and uh, Casey was speaking last week. And, and we know that Paul, um, as he's... Um, got a reputation, and so we know that people have come, turned up from Thessaloniki, and said he's the guy, uh, and he is somebody who stirs up trouble, and so he's kicked out of Berea, and he ends up in Athens. Athens was under the, under the Greek empire, like the central focus of the world. Some of the greatest philosophers, and even the influential philosophers, if you're interested in politics, or you've heard of something called democracy, Um, It's invented by the Greeks. They have such an amazing impact on the world. And even some of the Greek philosophy of its day still is really influential, how we understand things like science. How Think of like Plato and Aristotle and Pythagoras, which I don't understand it, but some of you will. It is the most influential philosophy and thinking of its time. And even by the time we get to the Roman Empire, so the kind of capital really has now moved to Rome, but, but there are three major cities of the Roman Empire. So you've got Rome, you've got Athens, and you've got Alexandria further over in the east. And so the Apostle Paul finds himself in this place of ideas, this place of this epicenter of thinking, this epicenter of culture. And he arrives there, bizarrely, because he's been booted out of Berea, He's arrived there early, so he does what people do. If you, like, rock up in a city and you don't know it, you walk around. And so he walks around, and in verse 16, it says, Paul, while Paul was waiting for, in, for them in Athens, that's Silas and Timothy, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. Okay, so Athens is a city which is full of images, it's a city which is full of sculptures and of arts, and each, each, kind of, each um, sculpture or piece of art traces some kind of route to its philosophical origin. So you can't walk around Athens without seeing something somewhere, some sculpture, some kind of masterpiece. It's a city of the most amazing architecture. It, it's, um, even now people say it's a really beautiful place to visit, but even then it would have been absolutely stunning. And so Paul is spending this time walking around, and we're told that he is greatly distressed by what he sees, which is kind of weird because if you want to go for a city break, it's a great place to go. And Paul's on this kind of unscheduled city break, but yet there's something about it that just doesn't work for him. And the word here is distressed. It comes from a Greek word, which is paraxino, (laughs) paraxino, which means, I don't know why I found that funny, just did, sorry. 
It was weird. I know, just confessed it, realized as I was laughing, that's awkward. Sorry, folks, I'll press on. But it means um, that he is so distressed. Alice, stay with me. Don't giggle because you go and it made me laugh. He is so distressed. It's like he's having a, the, the word is almost to describe um, a seizure or a fit. I mean, it is, he is gripped by something really quite profound. He is overwhelmed by, he, he, he is just overwhelmed by what it is that he sees. And the same word that we get here in, in, in the original Greek, we see in the Greek writing of the Bible. So as we know, the scripture is written, um, in, it's recorded in the Old Testament in Hebrew and in the New Testament in Greek. But over the years, as, as the church developed, the, the, the whole of the Bible was translated into Greek. And so we get the same word to describe God's jealousy, this sense of provoking, this deep, guttural response. It's more than just a sense of frustration. It's just this deep, internal uh, angst, this deep, internal pain almost that God himself experiences when the people of God are caught up with other things. It's almost a word to describe jealousy. It's often used, actually, when God is described, he, God is jealous. When the people of God turn away from him and follow other things. It's the same word that is used to describe how God responds when the people of the Old Testament turn away from him. It's this really profound experience that the Apostle Paul has on his encounter with the Athenian people and walking around kind of sensing and feeling what is going on in a particular place. And Paul's response is deep and it has this deep impression upon him. I don't know whether you have ever been to a city or a place and you've just got a sense of somewhere. Have you ever had, like once, Clarissa and I went to Stockholm in Sweden. And it's like a beautiful place. I mean, it's the land of Ikea and Nordic Noir. It's an amazing place. But it's really interesting because as we walked around it, what we noticed was that in the shop windows and the kind of mannequins and things like that, there was just, there was quite a lot of, um, the, the kind of be, you know, the models would be dressed with clothes, but, but often there'd be a, a kind of strange mask on, on, on the face of the mannequin, which is, well, that's a bit strange, isn't it? And we just walk around thinking, it just feels a bit, it feels like there's an element of darkness. Just could, couldn't put a finger on it. Just thought maybe, you know, maybe it's been a bit super spiritual or something. And then we stayed in a flat there with some folks we knew who lived in London, and they said, oh, you know, it's really interesting. There's a deep sub youth culture which is quite dark high rates of suicide that she's kind of drawn from this kind of grungy feel of a music scene and they said it's a real concern for the Swedish government and it's a, Swedish, it's a real concern for mental health professionals but the believers were praying for the nation because they felt there was a darkness and we just walked around and picked up on it it might be that you go to a, there's a particular city that you're aware of or a place or part in the city where particular things happen and you just think, well, it's just something here doesn't quite feel right. And Paul's walking around in this city which is the perfect destination for a city break. And whilst other people, they're obviously not taking photos because this is brief, but, but for him he's like, there's something that grieves his heart. There's something that grieves his spirit because he sees these images, these idols which essentially are a, an image to how smart and how clever human beings are. And it grieves him. It distresses him. It gr grabs hold of him. And so the thing that... Stir and the thing, and we're just in verse, um, verse 16, is that it's important to just to acknowledge in this moment that the scripture says he's greatly distressed to see the idolatry in the city. And so that becomes the fuel for him 
to step later as we were, it says this in verse 17 so he reasoned in the synagogue which is the practice if you've been tracking with us throughout acts we'll know that whenever paul rocks up to a place the first thing he does as a jewish rabbi as a jewish scholar he goes to find the synagogue where god the, the jewish people would gather every saturday and he and he reasons and he talks with them to jews and to god fearers but then he also says he heads into the marketplace but before we say something about the marketplace let's just reverse slightly because the Apostle Paul is so moved by what he sees in the city. He's so profoundly distressed by it. And that we know that the same Greek word to use, which I'm going to try to say it again this time. I didn't pronounce it right, which set myself off. Paroxino is say, used to describe God's jealousy when we turn away from him. Or particularly when the people of God have turned away from him to follow other, other things. That's what Paul feels. It's like looking around at the city thinking, you're not designed to do this. You're being, you're being drawn away from God. You're being, you're being drawn into idolatry. You're being drawn into the worship of humans. And it just grieves him. And so but it's, what the interesting thing is, is, it, is he is so full of love for Jesus that Paul doesn't do his thing that we as Christians can do. is just wag our finger at people and say, you are so wrong. He's drawn with a love for God that he's moving his heart. And so what he does is he goes to the central place of the city, the marketplace. Now, to be honest, we need like three weeks really to work our way through this chapter. So I'm just going to say something super quick about the marketplace. Now, when you think about a marketplace, don't think about somebody going fish. Two pound a pound. That, I'm not talking about that, okay? What I'm talking about is the marketplace is the very epicenter of, the ci of city life. It's the place where if you want to know what's happening in the news, because the internet's a little slow back in those days, that's a joke, okay, I'll press on, is that you would go to the marketplace and you'd listen out for the herald who would be shouting what's going on in the world or in that city, or if you want to know what's going on. This is a place where people will be doing deals and trade. It'd be the place where um, economists would be debating ideas, or people would be buying and selling, where all kinds of legal transactions would happen, where people would be debating philosophy. It was a place of a cacophony of noise and of chaos. But that's where Paul goes, because that's the marketplace. That's where the people are at. It's like when you're walking into you, when you're walking into work tomorrow morning, or maybe you're walking into your classroom tomorrow morning at 7:30, and you're like, oh. or maybe you're walking into your office, or you're walking onto the ward, or you're raising your kids. It's that's the place where people are. And Paul chooses that place because he loves people. And he loves a people who he sees are not following in the ways of God, but he's motivated by a deep love for these people. He is motivated by this deep, passionate love for the Athenian people, that he loves them. He's so moved by the situation they're in that he's propelled to speak the truth. It is so easy for us to speak badly of our city or to, to see stuff happening in our city and be really quite repulsed by it. I mean, the, what Paul saw in Athens would have been repulsive to him, that he would have wanted to potentially step away, but he's propelled with a love for the people, so goes to where the people are, where he's going to have most maximum impact, and that happens to be the marketplace. So the question for us is, that the things that we're involved in, whether we're involved in our schools, and there's particular places and people in school that we don't like, or there's a particular group of people that we don't like, or maybe in, we're doing this stuff on mission in university, and there's people and places that we don't like. It, the poor is so motivated by love, he's propelled to go to the places that a lot of people won't want to go. But he's propelled to go from a heart and place of love. What it says is he reasoned, and I've read that bit already, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, two major philosophical schools of the time. Epicureans, this is an absolute 
Wikipedia version, folks, is this. It's a sense of we don't know. We, we have a loose understanding of deities and gods, but we're just going to party because we don't know. We're just going to have a great time. And Stoics believed in some senses about how do we understand pain. And so the more pain in our life, we kind of press through life, that, that, that our, our, our ability to make life work. Both have a philosophy of life. One is you party all the time because you don't know what's coming. So why worry about it? Just party. Or one is that life is full of pain. And so the way we understand that is by per- persevering and pressing through that to make sense of the world. And so the Apostle Paul is in the midst of that as they're discussing and they're debating. He starts to have that conversation. Some say, what is this babbler trying to say? Which is encouraging. It's going well for him, isn't it? Others remark he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to to the meeting of the Oropagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. Okay, so what's going on here? You see, the Apostle Paul is not going into the marketplace, wagging his finger, shouting, turn or born like the guy with the megaphone that you avoid in the city center. You know? We all see them, right? And when I see them, I think, should I be doing that? Because I just admire their courage. But actually, he's not doing that because what we know is that people, as people debate this, some say he's babbling, but then he is invited into the Oropagus. What's the Oropagus? It's the place where you bet the very best philosophers. So Paul is obviously speaking in such a way with love and respect, and he's kind of thinking through what he's, he's bringing some fairly intelligent conversations and discussions to such a degree that he wins the hearts of the people that he's talking to. It is easy for us to think in preaching the gospel, the more offensive we are, the more faithful we are. And you know, there are times to stand on the street and say it like it is, with your megaphone. In fact, we have a megaphone in the office. Just occasionally, we should send Liam out. I love post-COVID Liam. What's he going to say on the streets? This could be awesome. But there's a way in which he's able to navigate the culture. He's able to speak into culture. He's able to engage with people and yet speak of Jesus and the resurrection in such an engaging way that people want to know more about Jesus. Now, we also know that in Thessaloniki, he's been kicked out of the city. And in Athens, it, the temperature turns up, and then we know as he gets to Corinth, that, you know, it, it, it's not always, it's, Paul does not not always have an easy time. But there is something about how he engages with people that I think we need to take notice. So much so that he's then drawn into the courts of the best philosophers of his time, the places where the ideas are shared, the news is shared, and he's there in the midst of this. And then he's brought into the Areopagus. And this is like the moment. This is like for him being, he's got like, he's got like prime time TV. This is like his moment. And you know, there's a theologian called Tom Wright, and he reckons he probably only speaks for about two and a half or three minutes. I mean, for a generation that has a short attention span, and this is, this is just amazing what it is he says. And this is what he says here. Paul stood up in the meeting of the Oropagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, he's kind of speaking with a a respect. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. And then he says this, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Paul is the most skilled rhetorician. He has this ability to use rhetoric 
in a culture where you would, the, the, the better you were at rhetoric, the more chances you were, you're getting your hearing. So by now, he's got them. Because he's been respectful on the one hand, <laughs> he said, your ignorance of the everything you worship. And in a culture that prides itself on knowledge, that would get their attention. And this is what he says. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and does not live in temples built by human hands. So he's appealing to the very, very Judeo-Christian notion that at the very beginning of time, it is God who created everything. And it says this, and he's not served by human hands as if he needed everything. You see, it was common in, in Athens at that time to pick out your particular God and go and maybe make a sacrificial offering at certain points in the year. And Paul is saying, actually, the God of heaven doesn't need your bits of sacrifice. He needs your whole, he calls your whole life. In fact, the God of heaven and earth gave his life for you. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out and find him. Though he's not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we're God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, to turn back to him. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this, this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, again, we've talked about this as we've tracked through Acts. One of the key features of Paul, the Apostle Paul's message is that Jesus rose from the dead. Some of them smeared and others said, we want to hear you again on this subject at that Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul, among them Dionysius, a member of the Oropagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. 